session six of Journey to Your Place of Grace. We're going to title today's session, The Gates of Grace. I think it will begin to become clear to you as we start to talk about how there are different things in our life that are gates to allow people access to our place of grace. And that's going to make a lot of sense as we go through today's session. We want to stay focused on this yellow circle, which is our place of grace. Remember, it is in the kingdom of God. It's not outside the kingdom of God. It's only when we are in the kingdom of God that this place of grace that I believe the Bible very plainly explains to us is active in our lives. Now, the first thing I want to point out, we've talked about grace, we've talked about mercy, we've talked about righteousness, we've talked about sin, all these different factors that are a part of this idea, but we need to look at the function, the purpose of our place of grace. First of all, it has spiritual value. It's not available to people that are not sons and daughters of God, of the Most High God. We have to be born again. We've talked about that in previous sessions. But while it has spiritual value, we also need to understand that the way its efficiency is measured is in human currency. In other words, our place of grace, the purpose of our place of grace, is so that we can interact with other human beings as we represent God. That's exactly what it's set for, what it's designed for, and what it allows us to do. And so as we go through today's scriptures, and today's going to be a lot of scripture to basically pull together what we've been talking about. As we go through these scriptures, I think that you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of oh yeah moments when you say, well, yeah, that's why that's that way, or that's why the Word of God says this, and that's how that works in my life. And so as we do that, I want you to remember that we've got two foundational scriptures that we've built this whole study on. The first one's found in Proverbs chapter 25, and it says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, the glory of kings to search it out. So we're searching out things that God has concealed in his word, and I think today will be just another one of those examples of how there's some things that we have read over and over and over in scripture, but when we look at them from God's perspective, they maybe look a little different than what we've talked about. And our second principle is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 46, the apostle Paul says, the spirit natural is not first, the natural is first, and then comes the spiritual. And we have discovered over the past five sessions that what that means is that there are natural examples of God's working with mankind in the Old Testament, especially where we see the natural example of that. And when we get to the New Testament, because we are now born of the Spirit of God, we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us, we can understand the spiritual lesson that was behind those, those natural examples. And so having that foundation, we're going to move today into our first scripture, and we're going to start in Colossians chapter 3, verse 7. I think you're really going to like this one. It says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, remember, we've talked a lot about this word name, and it's extremely important that we understand the concept behind the idea of name. In the Old Testament, it's the word shem, and it literally means character of. In other words, the name of God is his character. He has revealed himself to mankind in multiple ways, and most of the time he will do it in a compound name that starts with the word that we would pronounce as Jehovah, Yehovah, and he'll say, I am Jehovah Shalom, I am the God of your peace. I am Jehovah Nissi, I'm the God of the banner, your identity. And he has all of these compound names, and what they do is reveal his character, and he ties them to who he is. And so when we look at this idea of doing things in the name of the Lord, we have to think about we're doing them in the character of God. So the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, anything you do, whether it's word or deed, I, by the way, might add thought to that because we know how important our thoughts are, do it in the character of the Lord Jesus. And that's why Jesus came to earth, was to give us an example, a living example. The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, you see. And so we're seeing a physical example of the character of God himself as he manifests himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we do that giving thanks to the to the Father through him. And that's a, a good way to start our study for today. That's a good way to start every day, by the way. We want to move on to Romans chapter 14. 
And as we do this, we're going to look at some things that the Apostle Paul has given us as doctrine for how we are to activate, how we're to function within this place of grace that we've been talking about. In Romans chapter 14, he says these words, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Now, the conversation that Paul's having in chapter 14 of Romans with the, with the Romans is about food and dietary laws and eating things sacrificed to idols. And I think the important thing that we should notice in, in this particular text is that even when it comes to things as simple as what are we going to eat, that there are considerations we need to make about what's going on in the kingdom, how we're representing the kingdom, and how does that affect others around us. Remember, this is all about our interactions with other human beings. Now, we'll see that unfold more through this session. So he says, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. We're going to talk about peace a little bit later, but this idea of edifying one another is going to be paramount to what we talk about today. Our place of grace is not about us. Now, I realize we have focused on, well, God has given me grace. God's given me a measure of faith. God's get all these things that we've talked about. I'm inside of my place of grace. I'm outside of my place of grace. I'm constricting my place of grace. There's a lot of my, my, my there, but we need to understand that's all within the context of how does it affect the edification of other people? or the lack thereof, I guess you could say. And so that's paramount to what we're talking about today. Understand this, as we go through today's session, we're recapping all that we've talked about in the way it works. And the way it works is in relationship with other human beings. If it were not for other human beings, we wouldn't need grace. <laughs> you see, there, would, there wouldn't be any way to sin if we didn't have other human beings in the world, because that's the, that's the place that that interaction takes place. That's, that's the place that that confrontation takes place. Get that kind of set in your spirit, and we'll see how that works out as we go through today's session. So here we are. We've got gates of grace. I want to propose to you that our place of grace, we've been talking about this delineated place, this measurable place. Now I want to propose to you that I think it has gates. It's not just a fence that's built all the way around us of, of some kind of imaginary type. No, it actually has gates. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I think there are principles and precepts in the Word of God that we can either allow to be open where other human beings can have access to our place of grace and we thereby can share what God has given us to them, or we can close them off and we can refuse to interact with other human beings, thereby withholding the grace of God that he has given us to share and minister to others. So this is a really critical idea in the whole conversation that we're having about a place of grace that God has given each one of us. Where do we find out about that? Well, we're going to find about that in Galatians chapter 5. Before we do, I want to explain one thing, though. We're going to have a toolkit that we'll talk about later on in our place of grace, and that toolkit are the gifts of the Spirit that God has given us. Well, there's talked about in multiple places throughout the scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, numerous other places where there's gifts that God gives to people so that they can accomplish the things he's graced them for. How do we use those tools? How do we activate those tools? I was thinking about an example of this. You could go down to one of your local car dealerships, and today we all know that cars are, are getting more and more sophisticated by the day. It's not like it used to be when I was a kid and we could park it out under the shade tree and rebuild our carburetor. That no longer exists. Today, you've got to have computers. you got to have special tools. you got to have manuals about how to do this and about how to do that. So you could go to your local car dealership. They could usher you back into the garage, and they could, they could set you in one of the mechanic's bays back there, bring in the most wonderful car that you've ever seen, the most elaborate car you've ever seen, and ask you to fix it. And if you're anything like me, you'd be lost as a goose. What am I supposed to do now? I don't know how to use this computer. I don't know where this special tool is to do this. I don't know where this meter is. Where do I find this place to plug this thing in? I mean, all these questions. Well, that's a lot like our place of grace. We have a lot of tools but if we don't have the atmosphere, the training, if we don't have the comprehension and understanding, the context of how to use those tools, then they're very ineffective to us. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. How, what's the context? What's the 
atmosphere that we use all of this in for the glory of God. That's what our grace is all about. And we're going to find that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. I'm sure it's very familiar to virtually everyone that hears it. Let me read it to you. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, if you're like me, you've been raised with that scripture with an abstract perspective of what these things are. Love. What is love? Well, remember we've talked about that. If you've got 100 people in a room, you get 100 definitions of love because they're all different. The same thing with joy and peace and patience. I mean, we look at these from an abstract perspective. Well, today we want to get a little more concrete, if you will, concrete perspective of what these words mean. And I believe as we do, that it's going to make a little more sense to us as we apply them to our place of grace. Our first gate is going to be love. Now, we've talked a lot about love, and our definition of love is simply this, reveal the Father. Remember, we talked about the name of God being his character. I firmly believe the biblical perspective of love is to reveal the character of God. If I love you, then I need to do it through the character of God. That's the only way that my love for you can be properly transmitted and vice versa, your love for me. Think about this. In all of your different relationships, we have different types of relationship with different people. I have one relationship with my wife. I have another relationship with my neighbor next door. You see, I can't love both of them exactly the same way. There are parameters to the love that I can express in those two different relationships. What are those parameters? They're the character of God. He establishes those parameters through his character. And so we've got to go to the scripture to determine what that character is. That's this idea of doing things in the name of the Lord. So let's look at this idea of love. Love is revealing the Father and having the Father reveal back to me. Does God love us? Absolutely. How does he do that? He reveals his character to us. Do we love God? How do we do that? Well, we're supposed to do it by revealing his character, reflecting his character back to him. If we do things that are ungodly, that's not expressing love to God. As a matter of fact, that's rejecting his love. And so you see how this all fits together. Well, let's go to John chapter 14, verse 15. This will begin to start to make some sense. What did Jesus tell his disciples? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Well, this idea of love, once again, where does he come up with his context for what he means by love? Well, if you are familiar, this is a Hebraism that's found in the New Testament. There are, there are so many of them, you know. Once you begin to recognize them, they just start to pop up everywhere. When he says, if you love me, what's he talking about? He's talking about the Shema found in Deuteronomy. And that was to the Hebrew, to the Israelite, that was embedded in their psyche. It was embedded in their spirit. Every morning when they got up, every evening when they went to bed. Hear, O Israel, hear the word Shema in Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So that was their idea of love. It was the first commandment. Love the Lord your God. And and you do that by putting your whole being into it. Well, Jesus was asked this question. He says, you know, what's the greatest of the commandments? And what was his answer? Well, his first answer was, well, it's love the Lord your God. Why? Because it comes from the Shema. But then he goes on and he expands that a little bit. And he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, now, that takes us to a whole different level because we can love God, or at least we can fool ourselves into thinking we're loving God by trying to be godly when we think he's watching. But you see, he's watching all the time, and so there's a fallacy in that process. But we need to understand, not only is he watching whether or not we are godly toward him, but he's watching whether or not we're godly toward others, where we're expressing that character toward others. So this idea of love is something that permeates everything we do. It's, it's around us constantly. There's no way that we can get around it. It's the foundation stone of our relationship with everyone we come in contact with and with God himself. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. We've read this over and over. And you might remember, I like this definition of reveal the Father in place of the word love, because I think it just gets 
gets so dramatic when you read it that way. In 1 Corinthians 13, the apostle Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I don't reveal the father, I have become just noise. You see what he's saying there? He's saying, if I don't reveal the character of God to somebody, I can have all this religious vernacular I want, and it doesn't mean anything. It's just racket. It's just noise. And he ends that chapter by saying this, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of all of that, think about our faith. Our faith is what gives us guidance. Our hope is what we look forward to for eternity. But he says, even greater than that, is love. It's revealing the character of God to everybody we come in contact with. So how important as a fruit of the Spirit is this idea of love? Basically, it's the foundation on which everything else is born. And some people, by the way, would say that when you list the, the fruit of the Spirit, that that love is the overarching fruit and all of the others fall underneath it. I think there may be some merit to that. So we'll have to kind of judge that as we go through the rest of it. Now we're going to move on to the second fruit of the Spirit. And by the way, Jesus said that you will be known by our fruit. People will recognize us by our fruit. So we need to know what this fruit is, how it functions in our place of grace. Joy. The second one is joy. What is joy? Let's go to Romans chapter 14. And there Paul says these words. He says, do not let your good be spoken of as evil for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Remember, he's still having this conversation about food here. And that's because that's what the Romans are zeroed in on. That's their big issue right now. And so he's relating the truth of God's word to them based on this issue that they're dealing with. We can expand that into virtually any issue we have with mankind. He said, so the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. And he's going to give us a definition of what the kingdom of God is. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. We're going to talk about peace a little bit later, but what is our righteousness? Well, we know full well from studying Paul's writings that we don't function on our own righteousness. He says it's filthy rags. It's just trash. It's not worth anything. We've got to have the righteousness of Christ. And so if we're going to look at this from a kingdom perspective, we've got to understand that we have to have the righteousness of Christ to function with in our relationships. Peace, which we'll look at shortly, and joy. Well, this joy, what is this joy? Well, the joy we find is obviously in the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Now, that's an interesting way to judge whether or not we're being effective in the kingdom. That's not so that we get extra badges or honors or things like that. But if we're acceptable to God and approved by men, by the things that we do in the name of God, then that tells us that there's some effectiveness to there. I want to go to Psalm 16 to look a little further into this idea of joy. This is a messianic psalm. David wrote this psalm, and when he did, he wrote it from the perspective of Christ on the cross. Wouldn't you love to have a conversation with him and say, what in the world were you thinking when you wrote this? What, what, what was going on inside of you to write these words that you could project yourself centuries ahead of time onto the cross in the place of Christ and, and pronounce these thoughts? I think it's just a beautiful concept and idea. And we find that there are several times that David does that. Psalm 16 is one of the highlights. And in verse 11, he says this, you will show me the path of life. Remember, we've talked about this. Everything that God is concerned with is around life. You see, his greatest creation was not the universe, not the stars, not the, not the cosmos, not all the things that are going on that we see now through all these incredible telescopes we have. That's not the greatest thing God created. The greatest thing God created was life. That's why he is so protective of it. And that's why we need to be so protective of it in, in all areas. You know, we, we continue to see this battle going on about abortion. Why is that battle so heated? That battle is so heated because it's, it's at the very line of demarcation between what God values and what Satan is trying to destroy that God values. And so we need to understand there's a, there's a true battle going on here, and it's because that's important to God. So David says, you will show me the path of life. Remember, this is, this is Christ expressing himself. And he says this, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, we've got to think about this from the perspective of what 
Jesus was actually saying here, what Jesus was actually thinking as he hung on the cross. He has gone through an immense amount of suffering, more than we can even begin to, to think or imagine or conceive of. And he says this, in your presence is fullness of joy. Well, you can't say that from our perspective, he was having a lot of joy hanging on the cross. And then he goes on to say, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He wasn't, this was not a pleasant thing he was going through. Yet you see, there are times that we're actually called to, to share in the sufferings of Christ. Why is that? It's because we come into the presence of God when we do that, and there's a fullness of joy. So yes, it can be said that while Christ hung on the cross, even though he was bearing the sins of the world, there was still a joy in the presence of God that he was anticipating and moving into. He knew what lie ahead, and it's for that reason that he could bear that. And then he knew that there were pleasures forevermore. What are the pleasures forevermore that he is referring to? Well, the pleasures forevermore, first of all, would be reunited with the Godhead in a, in a perfect peace. But even beyond that is having the body of Christ, being complete in the body of Christ with you and I. He's even anticipating here in Psalm 16 that we're going to join him and that in that joining, in that coming together, will be pleasure forevermore. That tells you a little bit about what heaven is going to be like. That's something to really look forward to. Let's move on to Psalm 30. Psalm 30 verses 4 and 5 says this, Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. What is that word favor? Chen, grace. That's what we're talking about here. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, this is another one of those embedded Hebraisms that I just find is so interesting that we find in the scripture. Joy comes in the morning. We've got to go all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, to find the base, the root of this Hebraism. And there it says God is doing his creation. Remember, there's this history of his creation. And we come to this phrase that says, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Well, the idea here is, is different from what you and I experience. We think the day starts in the morning when we get up and go about our business. The biblical perspective of the day starting is going into the home. It's going back into those close relationships where we are strengthened, where we're encouraged, where we're repaired, where we come together and have this bond, this closeness that does what? It prepares us then for going out and doing the work of God. So when the psalmist says joy comes in the morning, his perspective is that joy comes after I have been in close communion with my family, with those that are important to me. I've been repaired from the day before, from all the activity that took place. My spirit has been quieted, and I have been given this rest, this Shabbat, this reprieve away from the cares of the world, and I'm ready now. And so my joy, where's my joy? My fullness of my joy is in the presence of God. My joy is in the morning when I can walk back out the door and represent God. You see the concept, the precept, the idea here that the psalmist is putting forward. And so we've got to think about that a little bit different than we do in our Western mindset. This is Ezra the priest, the scribe, and he has just finished reading the law. He says, then he said to him, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, this is a very interesting, by the way, another Hebraism. You've got to understand this from a Hebraic perspective. The book of Nehemiah is very interesting in that Nehemiah returns from the captivity in Babylon and comes back to Jerusalem. And when he does, he finds the wall that protects the city is in terrible shape. It's all fallen down. The gates are all in disrepair. Now, remember, we're talking about a wall, what? A fence, a hedge around a certain area. That's the same picture we've been looking at in our place of grace. And so what does he do? Well, he puts together a civic project and they repair the wall. They repair the gates. If you'll read those first five or six chapters of Nehemiah, it's an amazing story at the way they pull this off. They have to work with one hand and hold a weapon in the other because there's so much confrontation going on in the area around them. And so when they finish that, they bring all the people together. They build a wooden stand, according to Nehemiah chapter 8. And Ezra the scribe 
climbs up on top of it, and when he does, he reads the law. Now, we don't know how long this took. We don't know what portion he read for sure. Could have been the Torah, the first five books. Whatever it might have been, as he read this, everyone stood. And then they had all of the other rabbis that were there present that as he's reading, they would stop and they would then explain that word that was read to those that were standing around them. It was a marvelous picture. And when you read the story, it's like, oh, wow, this, this would have been a cool place to be that day. And when, he, and when he gets to the end, he gives them this advice. Now, this is what's interesting. He says, go your way. What is your way? Well, that's the journey God is going to send you on. So go back to your residence, go back to your marketplace position, go back to wherever it is that God has put you in our social setting. Eat the fat, drink the sweet. That means enjoy life, make the most of life. And then he says this, and send portions, obviously he's talking about food and drink here. He says, send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. That's interesting. If you'll read all the way to the end of this story, the report is, that not only did they eat and drink, but they sent portions. In other words, there's a verification that they heard what he said. And part of what he said was share with others, give this to others that don't have the capability of doing it for themselves, or that don't have the understanding of how to do it for themselves. And the verification here is they did that. So it's an important factor in the whole story. And then he makes this statement. He says, don't sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, if you'll go to that word joy and do a little word study on it, you'll discover something interesting. That joy doesn't mean happiness and giddiness and having a party and all those kind of things. That joy, the root meaning of that word joy, means to be joined. So this idea of being joined to the Lord is our strength. And when we have that, we have peace, we have well-being, we have comfort, we have hope, we have faith, we have all of these things that goes with that. And so what he's saying here is, that's not going to just make you happy and it's not just a party time. No, he's saying something much, much deeper than that. He's saying that if we will go back and be joined to the Lord and not be caught up in our sorrows, caught up in our problems, caught up in our issues, but focus on the Lord, he, he is our source, then that will be our strength. What a beautiful story. And so this idea of joy, another one of our fruits, and once we learn how to apply that joy, be joined to, the, to what God is, be joined to who God is, be joined to the kingdom of God and what he's doing in it, that will be your strength. That will be what prepares you, what carries you, what undergirds you. Well, our next fruit is peace. We've talked about peace multiple times. And of course, the definition I love of peace that we find from the ancient Hebrew is destroy the authority that establishes chaos in your life. Destroy the authority that's, that's establishing chaos in your life. Now, why do I think that that's a good definition? Well, I'm going to tell you, I think it is because 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 read this way. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. That's chaos. Sin is chaos. Sin is dysfunction from godliness. Okay, understand that. He goes on to say this. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Listen, if you get a hold of this verse, it will change your life. The purpose that Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth for was to destroy the works of the devil. Therefore, if you and I are in Christ, and, and there's no doubt about that, if you have problems with that concept or issue, study the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, and there you'll find Paul describes to us that our faith, our relationship with God is positional. We are in Christ. Everything in our faith journey has to happen through Christ and, and through his lens. And then God looks at us when he sees us, he sees us in Christ. He doesn't see us outside of Christ. And so this is a very important concept. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That's what creates peace. You and I, are to simply do what he did, destroy the works of the devil, and that creates peace. Therefore, one of the fruit of the Spirit that God has given us in our place of grace is an ability to destroy the work of the devil. That's why it's so important that when we minister to people, and by the way, this is another one of my soapboxes, we have pastors. Those pastors are called to carry official positions in the church. They preach to us. They, they shepherd us. They guide us. They direct us. The rest of us are 
are ministers. Make no mistake about that. You have to consider yourself to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. And as a minister, you are called to do exactly what Jesus did, and that is destroy the works of the devil. How do you do that? You function in your place of grace through the fruit of the Spirit using the tools, the gracings that God has given us to do that. And then he goes on to say this, whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him. That's the seed of God remains in us. That would be the seed of the Holy Spirit being implanted in us. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. John chapter three, how are we born of God? Jesus explained to Nicodemus, it's not a physical thing. You're born of the spirit. You're born anew. You're born from on high. And so that's what all of this discussion is about that John is having in, in first John, that small epistle. He's saying, look, we've got the same purpose Jesus had. Destroy the works of the devil. Bring peace in our lives and the lives of those around us, those that we minister to. And same writer, John, in chapter 14, records Jesus saying these words to his disciples. Jesus said, these things have I spoken to you while being present with you. He's reminding them of the stuff that he's taught them during the time that they walked and talked with him during his journey here on earth. He says, but the helper, and he defines who that is, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Wow, listen to this. Whom the Father will send in my character. Well, what's the character of Christ? He's the anointed one. That's what Christ means. So the character of Christ is to be anointed. So the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit in this character of anointing. So we're anointed with the presence of the Holy Spirit to do what? To do the work of the kingdom. And how do we do the work of the kingdom? We find our place of grace. We discover what the gates of grace are that allow it to function. And then we discover what the tools are, the giftings that the Holy Spirit has given us. And that word, by the way, is charis, which means gracings. The gracings that the Holy Spirit has provided us in order to do that. Isn't this a beautiful plan? And, and by the way, God hid it. <laughs> he hid it from the past. Jesus looked at the disciples one day and he says, your forefathers just longed to know what you're getting to see and, and discover and understand. And it's the same way. You and I are able to learn things and activate things in our life that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, all of those patriarchs wanted to know, wanted to know how to do this. They longed to know how to do this. And there was probably some frustration in their lives because they didn't have the ability to. You and I have this at our fingertips the word of God reveals this to us and we can simply walk into it. Well, he goes on to say this. He says, do this in my name. He'll teach you all things. It's what we're doing right now. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us. He'll bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Jesus' words are recorded in the scripture. We need to have them embedded in our heart. What did David say? Your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Once that happens, the Holy Spirit can bring them to our remembrance when we're in a place of ministry and we need them. That's an important process, and that only happens if we have ingested, if we have taken in the Word of God so it becomes part of our spirit. Jesus then says this important phrase, and, I, and this is critical to our understanding of peace. He says, peace I leave with you. And then he explains what he just said. He said, my peace I give to you. Now, all of a sudden, our antenna ought to pop up and we'll say, wait a minute, Jesus, what are you talking about? And then he goes on to say this, even, even digs a little deeper. He says, not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Well, automatically, we should put the brakes on right here and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Jesus just said there's more than one kind of peace. There's at least two kinds of peace in the world, his peace and the world's peace. What's the difference? Well, the difference is he came to destroy works of the devil. The world doesn't want to destroy the works of the devil. Why? Because that's what the world is all about, is the works of the devil. He's the prince of the power of the air. That's his whole intention, is to bring chaos and dysfunction to us. So if he gives us peace, what does he give us? Well, he just gives us the ability to come together and say, well, we're going to function on this level of chaos right now. We can deal with this until it all blows up again. It never lasts, okay? The peace of Jesus last forever. And then he goes on to say this, just as an assurance, just as a little insurance on the side, he says, don't let your heart be troubled and don't let it be afraid. 
So you see, this peace is something that's extremely important as a fruit of the Spirit to us because we need to understand this is an offensive weapon. This is not something that God gives us to be able to survive. Well, I got the peace of God about this, and so I'm just going to, I'm going to ride it out. I'm going to see how it works. I'm going to, no, the peace of God means we're going about the idea of destroying the works of the devil. Psalm 119, I love Psalm 119. It's an acrostic, and every eight verses are tied to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first line in each eight verses starts with a, a letter, a successive letter of the alphabet. And when we get to Psalm 119, verse 165, we're in the letter Shin. It's one of the latter letters. And that letter Shin looks like a W to us in the, in the Hebrew. And you might remember, if you've ever, you remember Spock? He, what did he used to say? He said, live well and prosper or something like that. That was a Jewish sign. The priest would hold their hands up when they pronounced the Aaronic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Well, they would, they would make that letter of the shin. Why? Because it's so important in their thought process. It's so important in the DNA of who they are as God's people. So when we get here, the first letter of the first word of the first line is shin, and that word is shalom. Now, when we translate it into English, we've obviously got to move the words around a little bit to make sense to us, and it says this, great peace have those who love your law. Now, you can say, oh, whoa, oh, wait a minute, Jim, wait a minute. We're talking about the law here. Well, we're free from the law. No, we're not free from the law. Because, and there's a reason we're not free from the law. We're not free from the law because we're inside of the one who accomplished the law. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. We are in him. He has fulfilled the law. So we can't go out and keep all of these ordinances of 600 and some ordinances. By the way, there's not even a temple to go sacrifice at. And it takes a temple to accomplish some 70% of the laws that are listed there. So we know that can't happen. How can it happen? It can only happen through Christ. And so great peace have those who love your law. So what's one of the, what's one of the biggest secrets that sometimes we don't talk about a lot? is that knowing what God said brings us great peace, a lot of peace. And so we need to understand that's one of the gates that we can open or close to be able to minister the grace that God has given us. We're going to move on now to some fruits that are described by words that are even a little more nebulous or elusive until we look at them from a Hebraic perspective. The next one is long suffering or patience, depending on the way that it's translated. Once again, the psalmist says this, but you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Now, how do we verify how do we comprehend that the psalmist was telling the truth there? We simply read the Old Testament. There are picture after picture after picture of God's long suffering contained in the Old Testament in his dealings with mankind. Why? Well, he tells them to do something. They say, yes, that's what we're going to do. We're going to abide by that commandment. And they walk right out the door and do something different. But God is long suffering. Why? Because he wants you and I to be part of that process. And he had to bring us to a place where he could administer the salvation of Christ so that that could be fulfilled. Let's go to Ephesians chapter four. I, boy, Ephesians, my favorite book of the Bible. I love it. And in chapter four, the apostle Paul is going to tell us a little bit about long suffering. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, by the way, I don't know if you ever thought of yourself that way, but he sees his calling to be that of a prisoner. What does that mean? Well, I don't think he looks at it from a negative perspective. I think he thinks, I'm captive by God. God knows best. God's going to provide everything that I need to do what he's called me to do and be. And therefore, I am perfectly comfortable calling myself a prisoner of the Lord. That, to me, seems like a positive term to him. He says this, I beseech you, listen closely, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Listen, there is no way once you read the Bible, and especially the New Testament, that you can say, I have not been given a calling by God. So many times I think we convey this idea of once you get your salvation, you've got what you need there. You're in good shape. We just need to, you just need to be a good person. You need to be a, a good churchgoer. You need, no, that's not true. You have a calling. 
and your calling is from a kingdom perspective. That's what our whole conversation has been about, that you have a place of grace, and in that place of grace, you're empowered to do what God has called you to do. And we're now looking at how he does that. First of all, he's giving you these gates that you can open or close so that you can affect your empowerment. If you open this gate of long-suffering with someone, then that gives them the ability to come into your place of grace. And it may take a while. You may have to be very patient with them. It may be a strenuous and arduous journey that you go on with them. But if you're walking worthy of your calling, this is a fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit will give you to be able to do that. Why? So that he can effectively use the grace that he's given you to minister to another human being, to someone else. Whether it's somebody that's in the body of Christ or out of the body of Christ. That's, that doesn't make a difference. We show favor to the ones, to ones that are in the body of Christ. There's no question about that because God has brought us together in a family atmosphere. But to those outside the body of Christ, we still have to show long suffering so that we can minister God's grace to him. He goes on to say this, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, how? In love, by reflecting the character of God, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That unity of the spirit means that as we function as the body of Christ, we do it as one. That word one is very important. We're going to look at that just a little bit later on. And in this bond of peace, what is this bond of peace? All together, we have been called to destroy the work of the devil and, and do away with chaos and dysfunction in our lives and the lives that God has given us influence in. And it's just very simple. There's just no other way to go about this idea of peace other than that is our calling. That is our objective. That's what God has given us to do in his kingdom work while we're in this life. He says there's one body. Okay, now this word one, by the way, again, it's very important. It's going to keep popping up. One spirit. There's one Holy Spirit. There's not multiple spirits. Somebody asked me the other day, well, Jim, there are, there are like seven spirits in Revelation, and that's not the same thing that we're talking about here. You can do a study on those seven spirits of Revelation. That's the wisdom that God has, has displayed, the way he displays his wisdom. Just as you were called in one hope, what? Of your calling. Make no mistake about it. The next word is kindness or goodness in the English. I want to take you to a, a story in 2 Samuel chapter 9 about David and Mephibosheth. The context of this story is about relationship. Let me give it to you just very briefly. David is chosen by Samuel to be a king of Israel, the next king of Israel. Saul is the current king, so there's a little conflict there to start with. And plus, he's just a kid. You might remember that whole story about his calling and his first anointing. But we find that Israel is at war with the Philistines. And they've got this issue with this giant named Goliath. And they're lined up out there in the Valley of Elah. One, one group is on one side of the valley. The other's on the other side of the valley. And, and it's, I'm going to say it's probably about 300 yards across there. So they get behind the rocks. They're hiding back there. They've got their camps. And for some reason, they're not coming out in the middle and fighting. I think it's because nobody wanted to fight. And so what do they do? They start sending this giant out by the name of, of uh, Goliath. And uh, he, starts, he starts insinuating that the God of Israel is not capable of taking care of them. And so he's hurling all of these insults. In the meantime, all of the Israelites are hiding behind the rocks because this guy's like over nine foot tall, I think. And nobody wants to go out there and fight him. They're all scared of him. David has been taking care of the sheep. His father sends him to bring some cheese and bread to his brothers on the battlefront. He does that, and when he comes up and gives them their bread and their cheese, he hears this giant out there in the middle of this big pasture, you know, and he's, and he's railing insults at God. And David looks at his brothers, and he says, who is this uncircumcised giant? You know, what is he going on about? And so they tell him the story. Well, you know, he's big, he's mean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The king said if one of us would go out and fight him, we could have his daughter. And so David goes back to Saul, and he says, hey, he says, I'll go fight that giant. Now, this is just a kid, okay? And Saul looks at him and says, well, okay. And Saul does what any earthly king would do. The difference between David and Saul is, is really displayed right here. Saul says, look, put on my armor. Saul's the only one that had armor. And what, where is his armor? It's back in his tent while the other guys are hiding out there behind the rocks and afraid to go fight. David puts the armor on. He says, oh, this doesn't work. I don't need your armor. He says, I fought the bear. I fought the lion. I, I know how to do this. 
So he goes out to the battlefront. He stoops down, and this is one of our examples of your place of grace. He picks up five stones, and he goes out and fights Goliath, kills him, chops his head off, carries it back. And when he does, everybody rejoices that David has killed the giant. In the process of this, Saul becomes extremely jealous. And so as we read the relationship between David and Saul, Saul's son, Jonathan, it gets extremely complicated. And we see that Saul, one minute, needs David to play his harp to to give him relief from the spiritual attack that he's under. And the next minute, he's throwing his spear at David, trying to pin him to the wall. I mean, it's just back and forth, back and forth. Anybody ever been in a relationship like that? Yeah, I'm sure you you can relate to this. Well, nonetheless, the story goes on. Saul and his son, Jonathan, are killed in battle. And once that happens, then we have this process where David then becomes the reigning king. When he does that, most of the time in that cultural setting, kings would either kill or incapacitate anyone that was related to the previous king so they didn't have an insurrection. David does just the opposite of that. David says, is there anybody from Saul's house that I can honor, that I can show kindness to? And sure enough, somebody says, well, yeah, there's this guy Mephibosheth. You read the story about Mephibosheth. He was just a child. And as they were trying to escape an an onslaught of the enemy, the servant that was carrying him dropped him. His feet were injured, so he can't walk. He's disabled. And so Mephibosheth is living this life of poverty and disability. And David says, bring him in. And when David brings him in, what does he do? He gives, he sets him at the king's table and he says, I want you to be with me. I want to give you back everything that belonged to Saul. And I want to honor you that way. In other words, I want to show you that kindness. Well, this seems a little strange to us. So we go to second Peter in the new Testament. We read these words, but for also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. Now, if you'll take the time and study that set of words, you'll notice they're progressive. We have to start with faith. And once we get a faith, we begin to add knowledge to it. So these things build on one another. And finally, when you get to the top of the heap, one of the things that you find there is brotherly kindness, goodness. In other words, this display that David showed on a relational basis, it was grace that he was giving to Mephibosheth based on who his relatives were, not based on who he was. You see, he did this based on something that had happened prior and knowledge that he had. And upon this building of godliness that he had in his life, he found that he had to show that. So that's one of the fruits of the spirit that God has given us. We need this foundation. And when we get this foundation built to a certain point, then the Holy Spirit will recognize, well, you understand how important it is to honor relationships and to value relationships. And so that's one of some of the fruit that I'm going to give you to operate in your place of grace. And so we learn how to honor other people. We learn how to respect other people, even though we don't agree with other people. We just learn how to deal with and handle all of those relationships. And then, of course, the the thing that he adds to that is love. That's the epitome of all of it. In other words, you've learned all these things. Now act with the character of God. In the book of Ephesians, we find this, chapter 2, But God is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved. I wish we could talk about this verse for a while. And he raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are now sitting in the heavenlies. We're doing that through Christ Jesus. Physically, we're still here on this planet, but we have access to the heavenlies through Christ. And that's a very important concept that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So this idea of kindness, we learn about kindness because God showed his kindness to us through Christ. And therefore, we're supposed to use that as an image. We're supposed to use that as a lesson to show that kindness back to others. And David is the good example of that with the way he functioned with Mephibosheth. Goodness We move on to goodness. The root word of goodness is tov, and it means something that functions properly. We need to understand, as God did the creation, you might remember again in Genesis chapter 1, he go to the end of day 1, he said, and it was good. The end of day 2, it was good. He gets all the way to the end of day 6, he said, it's very good. 
So this idea is functioning properly. <laughs> we know that that changed a little bit in the near future, but when God created it, it functioned properly. That's the idea of goodness. Psalm 33 says, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. That means that this earth functions properly based on the way God set it up. Everything in God's creation has his embedded order. And we've discovered some of it. We haven't discovered some of it. But we know that the earth is full of the goodness, the order of God. Isn't that incredible? Matthew 19, Jesus is having a conversation with a young man. And the young man calls him good. He says, hey, good teacher. And Jesus goes on to respond. And he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, again, there's a Hebraism here, and we understand this. Why? Because we understand the Shema. If you look in your Bible, just as I did in mine, you'll probably find that that second word, one, where he says no one is good but one, that particular one is probably capitalized. And that's the word echad in the Hebrew, and it means greatly enjoined, greatly combined for the journey. And so Jesus here is not saying, I'm not good. He says, I'm good as I'm part of the Trinity, part of the Godhead. And so a lot of times that's misunderstood. Jesus is not denying that he's good. He's just saying, my goodness comes from the fact that I'm part of the whole. So the same thing with us. Our goodness comes from the fact that we are one with Christ. And if we don't have that oneness with Christ, with all due respect, there's no goodness in us. I love this. Psalm 23, you probably know that psalm. For the sake of time, I'm going to move on down to where the psalmist says this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy there, tov and chesed in the Hebrew, Tov being the goodness, and it simply means the order that you have put in my life will follow me all the days of my life. Now, the key to this is this phrase, anoint my head with oil. And many times when we hear that phrase, we think, well, they would, you know, they would anoint somebody for the office or something like that. That's not the perspective that this story is told in. This is Psalm 23, and this talks about a shepherd. So we've got to say, well, what does it mean to anoint my head with oil in the way that a shepherd does? And if we'll go back and do a little research, we'll discover that sheep like to butt heads. They love to butt heads. They like to butt their head against a, a fence to try to get it out of the way. They butt their heads with each other. If you've ever watched goats, you know, they just seem to really have fun doing this. In the process of that, they damage their, their heads. They'll cut their skin and they'll have open wounds and things. And so what happens? Well, the flies begin to attack that. I mean, if you're in a, in a barnyard situation, think about this. So what does the shepherd do? He pours oil, olive oil, on top of the head of that sheep or that goat. And what does that do? Well, first of all, it's medicinal. So it helps them to heal, keeps them from being inflamed. But secondly, it also keeps the flies from pestering them and other things like that. And so this idea of anointing my head with oil means that you are, you're being good to me and you are helping me enjoy and participate in life. This idea, your goodness and your mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We've already seen the, the mercy of God is over all of his works, so we're included in that. But his goodness, his covering up of those things that irritate us or allow us to be agitated by outside forces. That's what the psalmist is talking about here when he looks at this idea of the shepherd. Faithfulness is our next word. Isaiah 25 says this, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Two incredible words, faithfulness and truth. David said in one of his psalms, your word is established in heaven. In other words, it will never change. And that's what we're talking about. These are God's counsels. They are permanent. They're eternal. They never change. And they are faithfulness and truth. That's how important this concept is as a fruit of the Spirit in our life. In the book of Lamentations, we find this, this phrase, great is your faithfulness. We even sing it, you know, great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. I mean, it's just an incredible concept that God's faithfulness is beyond anything we can understand. And it needs to be one of the fruit of the Spirit that we have to operate in our place of grace. We need to be faithful in our character just as he is in his. Gentleness, 
gentleness in 2 Samuel chapter 22. By the way, this is a song of David. It was written by David. And probably at some time that he was about to face some enemies, they were about to go to war. So they're going to be in a situation where he, he needed God's oversight. He needed to make sure God was with him. He said, you have also given me the shield of your salvation, your gentleness. And that word gentleness there, the root meaning of it is not just that he was meek and, and he was kind and he was non-confrontational. No, the word gentleness means an intense watchfulness. The picture of it that's, that's given in the language itself is a furrowing of the brows where you watch something so intently that that's all you're focused on. Well, that's that's this idea of gentleness as a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, when we're using our place of grace in relationship to someone else, we should be focused on what's going on with the relationship with that person and how the Holy Spirit wants to use our place of grace to minister to them. Once again, it's not about us. It's about everyone else. And this is a beautiful picture of that and has made me great. The word great there means you have enlarged me or you've made me grow up. And I think so many times we just need to use that term grow up when it comes to Christians, because I have seen so many circumstances in my life where Christians will get bitter with each other. They'll begin to, to fight and to have differences. And they let those things divide them and separate them and do damage in the body of Christ. When if we would just all grow up and think about the fact that God has called us to his business, not ours, then we wouldn't have a lot of these issues. Enough on that. I can't go any further there. I love Philippians chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness, your intense watchfulness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. In other words, if we're going to be gentle, people need to say, hey, that guy's intent on what God's got him doing. That's the sign of gentleness that we're looking for. Self-control. This is a good one. Joshua 1, 7 to 9. I really love the example of Joshua. I encourage you to go back and read the first several chapters of Joshua. You'll see the picture of what we mean here by self-control. And the way it's explained to Joshua is this. The angel of the Lord says, only be strong and very courageous. He's repeating what Moses said when he gets this message. Be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all that the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Self-control brings us prosperity. Prosperity is not monetary gain. Prosperity is being successful in our place of grace. And to do that, we have to be courageous. Being courageous means that we have to use self-control. We can't be pushed around by this whim or by this idea or by this particular thing that's going on in the culture right now. That's why we need to be strong as we stand against the culture, this idea of wokeness and all this stuff that's going on. We've got to know the lens of scripture to be able to deal with all those things. Well, that takes us through this session of our journey of a place of grace. And it explains the gates that open and close, that we have the power to open and close in order to be effectively minister to other people in our place of grace. And remember, the way it's measured is in human currency. In other words, is God using the grace that he has given us in our place of grace to be able to affect other human beings for the kingdom of God? That's the way we measure whether or not we're successful. Short of that, we're just wasting our time. Just like Paul said, we're just noise. We're just a clanging symbol, you know, and we don't want to be that. We want to be effective for the kingdom of God. Well, listen, God bless you. I encourage you to study the gifts of the Spirit, because if you will, you'll discover that God has gifted you in unique and special ways. Now, one note about that is, and this is a whole teaching in itself, the gifts of the Spirit, as outlined in, in those places I mentioned, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and numerous other places in the Scripture, the gifts of the Spirit come in two different ways. First of all, they come static. In other words, God gives us a gift of the Spirit, which we have all the time available to us. He might give us a spirit of wisdom. If he does, then he has brought us to a place because we've invested our time in his word. We've invested our time in the kingdom to where we have wisdom available to us in virtually any situation that somebody needs some wisdom from God. And we can share that with them. The second way, and by the way, that works with all the gifts of the spirit. Some people have gifts that just seem to be available to them all the time. Faith, whatever it might be. Others don't. Other times we get individual gifts of the spirit 
which are episodic. That's the word that's used to explain this. Simply means they come for an episode. You may in, be involved with someone and they have some kind of a unique challenge going on or a need that they have in their life. And because you're in your place of grace, because you got your gates open to them and you're allowing them to come into your place of grace where they can receive the ministry of the, of the power of God, then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will give you an, for an episode, for that episode, he'll give you a specific gift to use. That's an exciting time when that happens. The interesting thing is, always remember, the gifts are not about you and me. They're about everybody else. And therefore, just because if God allows you to raise somebody from the dead, don't go out and start and start writing books about raising people from the dead. No, he may have just given you that gift because for some reason for his kingdom, somebody need to be raised from the dead. Now I realize that sounds a little extreme, but it still happens today, mostly in other countries where they don't have some of the hangups we've got. But all of the gifts of the Spirit operate that way. So be ready for the Holy Spirit to give you any gift he chooses so that you can use your place of grace to minister the love of God to somebody that he's brought into your life. If you'll do that, then you're going to find that your journey to your place of grace is going to be exciting and fulfilling. Listen, we love you. Pray that God will use this teaching greatly in your life. And until the next time we meet, may God bless and keep you.